Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the launch of Dr. Shazia Rahman's book, Place and Postcolonial Ecofeminism, Pakistani Women's Literary and Cinematic Fictions, which is being published by Folio Books. Uh, this session is jointly hosted by both ThinkFest and Folio Books. Um, this book is a very um, exciting new project that is really the first comprehensive study of its kind of Pakistani literary and cinematic fictions and the ways that we can think about women's relationality to the environment as a means of thinking of alternative modes of belonging, identity politics, and uh, socio-ecological justice. Our esteemed panelists for today include Dr. Shazia Rahman, uh, the author of the book, uh, Dr. Bhasha, uh, and Dr. Chambers. I'll briefly introduce our panelists, of course. Uh, Dr. Shavia Rahman is Associate Professor of English, specializing in post-colonial literatures at the University of Dayton. Her research and teaching emerged from her intersecting interests in global gender and environmental issues and include South Asian literature and culture, environmental justice, and ecofeminist theory. Dr. Rahman's work has appeared in the Journal of Commonwealth Literature, Journal of Post-Colonial Writing, Aerial um, a Review of International English Literature, Interdisciplinary Studies in Literature and Environment, Environmental Communication, and literature interpretation theory. She's also the guest editor of a forthcoming special issue of South Asian Review titled The Environment of South Asia. Um, and of course, is the author of the book that we shall be discussing today. Dr. Amit Ambhasha is an associate professor in the Department of English at the University of Oklahoma. His first monograph, Contemporary Literature uh, from Northeast India, Death World, Terror and Survival, was published by Rutledge in 2018. He's also the co-editor of three collections, Northeast India, Place of Relations, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2017, Postcolonial Animalities, published by Rutledge in 2019, and a special issue of the journal Postcolonial Studies titled Planetary Politics, Postcolonial Theory, the Anthropocene, and the Non-Human, which came out in 2021. He's currently co-editing a special issue titled Insights, Outsides, Anglophone Literatures from Northeast India for South Asian Review, and is also writing his second monograph on species extinction, deep time, and multi-species cohabitation in contemporary post-colonial literature. Dr. Bhasha translates short stories and novels from Assamese to English. His translation of Devnandrath Acharya's Assamese novel, Jangam, on the forgotten long march of Indians from Burma during World War II was released in 2018. Dr. Claire Chambers is a professor in global literature at the University of York. She is the author of British Muslim Fictions, which was published in 2011. Britain Through Muslim Eyes, and published in 2015, and Making Sense of Contemporary British Muslim Novels, published in 2019. She's also published a collection of her essays entitled Rivers of Ink. Finally, she co-edited Imagining Muslims in South Asia and the Diaspora and A Match Made in Heaven. Um, her research has been supported by funding from HEFCE, the British Academy, the Leverhulme Trust, and the AHRC. She has also been editor-in-chief of the very well-known journal of Commonwealth Literature for 10 and a half years. And it's just um, recently, I think, like moved on to other projects. Um, I will now invite Dr. Rahman to give us an overview of the book, after which we will invite our panelists to share their remarks and their thoughts. And um, at the very end, we will open up the session to the audience for a question and answer session. So without further ado, um, Dr. Rahman, you can take over. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Saba, for your generous introduction, really of all of us. Thank you so much. And thank you to the Amit and Claire as well for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to Folio Books for publishing uh, Place in Postcolonial Ecofeminism and to ThinkFest for sponsoring this launch of the book in Pakistan. I am so thrilled that this is happening, even in a pandemic that has worn us down, even in the middle of brutal murders for which we mourn, despite all of it, um, which we cannot and should not forget or ignore. Um, I'm grateful that we can take some time today to pause and to think and to maybe connect some of the dots between the different kinds of oppressions, um, you know, capitalism, patriarchy, right? Connect the dots uh, between these different kinds of connection uh, oppressions um, and that's actually what I've tried to do in my book. I wanted to begin today by talking about how I came to the book um, before I summarize the book, because I think that that's important. For me, it's important 
for the launch of the book in Pakistan for me to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so I, I was born in Pakistan. I was raised in Canada. I traveled a lot. Um, I actually lived in Islamabad in the 1980s. I apologize. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm so sorry. Um, so, internet. I have internet issues. Um, yeah. So I, I I lived in Islamabad in the 1980s, and the reason I mention this is because I was a teenager, and um, I went to college um, in F7. And I, I mention this because there has been very recently a brutal murder of a woman in F7 in Islamabad. And I and that is why I say we mourn and we cannot forget. And I, I, I realize that we're launching my book and, and this is a great, wonderful occasion. But I, I, I think it's important to mention this. Um, anyway, during that time, um, a childhood friend of my father's said to me, Bita, what will you do for Pakistan? And I was a teenager. <laughs> I was a teenager and I said, I don't know. I was a goofy teenager. Uh, I don't know. What, what should I do for Pakistan? And he said, Bita, you let me know what you will do because you have to do something for Pakistan. And I, you know, um, figured it out very late. Um, I left Pakistan. I studied. I became a professor. Um, and very late after he died, um, all these things started happening and Pakistan was in the news and I felt that I should do something. And, and so I teach. So I started teaching the literature and um, I found that in the news, the stories we heard were stories about men, by men. And uh, the way that I came to this book was I really, I really just wanted to talk about, you know, what are the women saying? What are the stories that women are telling? That was important to me. And that's, that's what I, that's what I wanted to, to talk about. So I started teaching this course where I, I, I taught uh, women's films and women's uh, Pakistani women's uh, literature to my students, and um, and and that's how this that's actually how this this book came to be. Now I mention um, my father's friend uh, and his insistence that I do something for Pakistan. He he said that to me um, because he was a nationalist, and I have great respect for him to this day and all nationalists, uh, but I am not a nationalist. If you read my book, you will find that I'm much more interested in places than I am in nations. And, and maybe it's because I've lived in a lot of different nations. And uh, maybe it's because I'm interested in place, which means I'm interested in the environment. Um, and so you know, there are ways in which topographical features like mountains and oceans uh, extend beyond international borders. And, and maybe that's what it is. But whatever it is, um, I am no nationalist. Um, I live in the U.S. And, um, and so I'm not comfortable with the idea of nation. Uh, my attachments are to places and the idea of place. And that's really uh, what my book is about. The first word in the title of my book is place uh, because that is what interests me. And, and, and so what is this idea? What is this idea of place? Um, it, is, it usually en encompasses uh, human and non-human beings. Um, it usually is, uh, has much more to do with a region um, than where international borders happen to fall. Um, and it includes water and land and mountains and oceans. Um, and, and it includes this idea that uh, 
you know, when people share the same environment and they share a number of things in common, um, they share language, they share a history. And so place includes history. Um, and when we think about uh, time, uh, I believe, and my book shows that we should also think about space, that we should think about space and time together. Um, and I guess one simple way of thinking about this is that Islamabad in 1981 is not Islamabad in 2021, right? And so when we think about place, when we think about time and space together, we can get at that. Um, and, so, and so I wanted to write something about the place that is Pakistan. And I wanted to see what I would discover if I considered you know, everything, the people, the trees, the rocks, the dogs, you know, the many, many women. Um, because so much of the impetus of writing a book about Pakistani women's literature and film was to emphasize women's voices. Um, so I wanted to I wanted to write about the stories that women tell. Um, and I wanted to amplify women's voices. Um, just to get to the book uh, more specifically, uh, there are five women, Pakistani women, who are novelists and film filmmakers, and I, and I discuss their works um, in a way that emphasizes the places that they write about, or if they're filmmakers, the places that we see on camera. That is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to emphasize the place. So um, Hamosh Bani uh, is a film that I discuss. It's very much the way I discuss it. It's very much the story of Punjab. And Punjab is not just in Pakistan. It's not just on one side of the border, right? Um, Ramchand Pakistani is very much the story of a desert. That's what we see. And that desert is not just on one side of the border, right? And so I, I talk about the place um, in sort of expansive terms. Um, Noor is the story of Bengal and that is also a place that is Pakistan, right? Trespassing uh, is a novel that is very much a story about Karachi because cities are also places. Um, and so they have, they have histories um, that we should honor. Um, and if I'm going to talk about all these different places in Pakistan, um, I need to also talk about displacement, uh, which I do in the final chapter of the book. I, I talk about displacement because, you know, who understands place better than the people who are displaced, better than those who are displaced? And so I wanted, I wanted to, to talk about displacement um, in, that, in that final chapter. Um, I wanted to honor that story as well. So, these are the stories that women tell. <laughs> um, they are the stories that I believe the world needs to hear. And uh, when I wrote this book, I, I wrote it uh, for Pakistan. <laughs> and so uh, I'm really grateful that uh, it will now be available in Pakistan, in Pakistani rupees. <laughs> right? uh, that matters to me. Um, so my attention to these stories actually goes far beyond the stories themselves because as I write about them, I weave in these environmental issues, right? I weave in uh, the poisoning of well, well waters, the poisoning of rivers, uh, global warming, and all the issues that come with global warming, uh, our relationships to animals. Um, I, I, I see non-human environment and non-human beings together in sort of an expansive way. Um, and so I include animal studies in, in the way in which I think um, all these issues and, and more need to be, I believe, at the forefront of our minds as we move forward. Um, and I hope that my book, its methodology of environmental criticism can be a reminder that as we fight for social justice, that we link together issues of environmental justice. Um, we don't have time anymore, I think, to focus only on 
capitalism or focus only on patriarchy or focus only on the environment. Uh, you know, the, the one issue, the single issue really uh, is, is not helpful uh, in our analyses, in our thinking. Um, honestly, I hope my book helps readers see how the problems are linked and that therefore the fight, the struggle must also be linked, right? Part of, part of, the, part of the place where the book comes to in the conclusion is my hope that, uh, that the, the women's movement in Pakistan, which is so strong and I'm so, so proud of the Arth March, I'm so uh, grateful um, for the women's movement that the, that the women's movement and those who are fighting for environmental justice, that environmental movements and women's movements come together and see those links. And I'm seeing that that's actually happening. Um, and I'm grateful, I'm grateful for this next generation. Um, so my, my book, because I'm a literary critic, I, I put forward this post-colonial uh, eco-feminist lens because I want to, in my analyses of literature, think about um, how colonialism and the aftermath of colonialism has affected um, these places that I talk about. And uh, so that's what I mean by post-colonial, how uh, when I talk about the eco-feminist, you know, the eco-feminist is one who sees the oppression of women, LGBTQ communities, and, and, and links those to the oppression of the environment, the oppression of animals, the oppression, like all of those oppressions are linked together. Uh, when I talk about ecofeminism, I, I, I want to link all those things together. And, and so I put forward a, a post-colonial ecofeminist lens uh, to help my readers bring together these different kinds of analyses. And um, yeah, I, I honestly want to hear from everyone else and I hope that we can have a robust discussion about all these issues. So thank you. Thank you for that really kind of incisive talk about the origins of the book and you know how it kind of unfolded. Um, I'll now invite Dr. Amit Bhashia to give his thoughts and then we can move on. Okay, thank you so much, Saba, for that wonderful in introduction. And of course, thanks thanks to Bilal, who's not here for inviting me. Um, and hello, Claire. Uh, as I said, uh, we've exchanged emails for, for uh, the journal, but of course I've taught your essay on Amitabh Ghosh's Calcutta chromosome for years. So it's always lovely to meet you in, in person. And uh, Shazia, uh, what do I say? We go back a long way. Uh, we met in 2016 at the MLA conference when my co-editor of Postcolonial Animalities and I had organized a panel called Animalities. And Shazia had presented her a segment from her chapter, which is on burn shadows. Eventually, that did not make it to our book, our loss, but she was writing her book at that point and she didn't want to expose too much of the material, we completely understand, but it's been a it's been a friendship which has grown over um, the last four or five years, and I'm very glad to be in this panel. Now, I'd like to begin, uh, first of all, by uh, talking about a claim uh, that she makes in her book, which I found very intriguing and interesting. I'd like to connect it to all my own work as well, uh, in terms of Northeast India, and I, where some productive synergies can come out. And of course, I'll effusively praise one chapter of the book, which I use for teaching. I'll talk about extensions uh, that can be done with her work, and of course, end with a friendly critique. So in that spirit, I'll begin with that, right? So I'll go to page nine of her book. I have the University of Nebraska Press version. I think I was one of the first ones to receive it because I was also one of the first ones to review it, right? So she writes on page nine uh, that I build on this feminist line of inquiry and take it further by theories of eco-criticism. And this is an important line. Rather than analyzing Pakistan through a religious and nationalist framework, this research shifts the center of analysis to the place that is Pakistan instead. Now, I find this very interesting and productive in two ways. First of all, unlike very idealist constructions of South Asia, which talks about like connections between India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and so on, uh, I think what Shazia does in this book, which is very interesting, is that she locates it very much within national borders, but she does not talk about it from a nationalist standpoint. And I think this is useful because when we think a little bit about 
nation states, they are containers, they do shape our thoughts in particular ways. Although there could always be alternative ways of thinking about this. To give you an example, my grandfather had business interests in colonial India in Burma, right? So family lore often talks about how they used to travel from Assam to Burma by elephant, for instance, to trade goods and so on and so forth, right? Now, when we're talking about national borders now, talk to the generation that comes after us, like my nieces and all, uh, about what's going on in Myanmar. They have no clue, right? It's like right next door, but they have no clue. So it, gives, it, it reminds me in some ways of an image that Amitabh Ghosh used, used in Shadow Lines, that when you draw a compass, it may be that to, I'm not following his example directly, but Guwahati and Chiang Mai might be closer to each other. But what happens in Delhi affects Guwahati far more than what happens in Chiang Mai. So this kind of container, the nation space is a container uh, in a way in which I would even say it colonizes our imagination as if there is no other spatial way of thinking about space becomes important, right? So I think this is an interesting way in which I think Shazia locates this so very interestingly within Pakistan, but I like this sentence. He says, not Pakistan, but the place that is Pakistan instead. And I think this is an important bit for us to think about, right? That there are many other histories of place, even within nation states. And to give you another example where I can connect it to things that I've seen or, 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 uh, or witnessed or talked to for that matter in Northeast India itself, in this border state of Arunachal Pradesh, which is now bordering uh, China, uh, we once interviewed a man, uh, the political uh, scientist, uh, Sanjeev Burra and I, uh, we both talked to him. This person was born in Arunachal Pradesh at a point of time when the border, borders between India and China were not that fixed. So he traveled to Beijing to study as a youth. And then of course, nations came into being, right? He couldn't travel back to his village as frequently as he could, right? When the 1962 war against China happened, um, he was used as a spy by the Chinese against the Indians, right? So he would come, he had contacts across the border and so on and so forth. Then in 1990, he went, he came over to the Indian side of the border. Now the Indians were using him as a child spy against the Chinese. I mean, this is like a Ripley's Believe or Not story in some ways. But when we interviewed him, he said something very interesting. My loyalty is to my village not to these nation states. And it reminds me of something that Shazia says in the second chapter of her book on Ramchan Pakistani, that you know, the character has, when, 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 uh, when she thinks about place, she thinks about her village, not about the larger constructs like India and Pakistan. And I think these are interesting ways in which place and place making can very often exist parallelly, right? With what we call this larger spatial container of the nation state, so to speak. And I think the way in which she opens up many of these questions is very productive for us, people like us who either work incidentally on Pakistan, like I teach Pakistan, Pakistani Anglophone text, I teach Manto quite a bit, but I don't really, I, I don't really work on Pakistan per se, but all, uh, if you think about it over the larger question of South or Southeast Asia at large, I think these are questions where larger synergies can be can be found. One extension, of course, which can be made is that placemaking is not made by humans alone, but also by non-humans. And I think in some ways, one of the things that could be pushed forward from this thesis in place and post-colonial criticism, obviously, is the way in which animals begin to make place. It's not about you know human boundaries coming and completely in some ways dividing you know animal corridors and stuff like that animals also have agency they also negotiate i was recently reading malini sur's wonderful ethnography on the indo bangladesh borderlands and the fence that has come up and she has a chapter there about elephants and how their behavior has changed over 50 years so in a way the elephants themselves are negotiating with place places so to speak in some ways so there's clearly human memories of place which are different but at the same times of which often compete with many of these official narratives which i think shazia brings out so wonderfully in her book but there are also these non-human elements which i think are so very fundamental to place making and also these interfaces between human and non-human which i find very interesting as well and to be very effusive about my praise um Kamosh Pani is, of course, a movie I teach quite a lot. And the chapter that Shazia has on Kamosh Pani, the way in which she thinks about water, both as material and metaphor, right, in many ways, and the way in which it circulates, the fact that water can be poisoned, but then you also have the kind of 
both the diegetic and non-diegetic sound of water pervading the film. I think that's that's a wonderful kind of attention to film form, which frankly, after I read her chapter, I've been using a lot in my classes as well, right? So it inspires me to teach or brings up new material in some ways. Again, to think of extensions, right? In many ways, it seems to me that place and post-colonial criticism opens up these, these, these questions about, you know, other histories that exist simultaneously with the nation state and so on. But I think what it can even be pushed towards, so to speak, in some sense, are questions of even deeper history, so to speak, right? Deeper, uh, let's say, deeper histories in the realm of the Anthropocene. I keep on thinking about the brilliant opening sequence and cartography, where in some sense, uh, you're thinking not only about the history of, of Karachi going back to Alexander's time, but through the fossil of the cuttlefish, you're actually bringing in deep time into the equation as well. And a lot of Pakistani texts are talking about this in such interesting ways, whether Geometry of God, um, uh, uh, the novel we don't, I, we often disagree about, uh, uh, the one, okay, Sajjah, remind me the title, please. Uh, I keep forgetting the about it. Blind Man's Guard. Blind Man's Guard, <laughs> Blind Man's Guard which actually, uh, when you told me about the very anthropo uh, scenic reading, it opened up a lot of interesting things for me, although as a text, I've never really enjoyed reading it or, or teaching it either. But, you know, there are so many of these other texts which, which bring up these questions of deep time, other histories, right? Think about the fossil, for instance, in Geometry of God, how it sort of comes back as another history into the time of the present. It brings up a deep time into the time of the present. And I think these are extensions that I would definitely say place and post-colonial uh, eco-criticism inspires us to take, so to speak. I mean, to in some sense unpack any of these other histories as well. And I'll just briefly end with a small uh, moment of critique, as I said, friendly critique, as I uh, in many ways, right? Um, it goes back, of course, to the question of the non-human. And I was reading that chapter on trespassing, and um, and there was this brief moment which I thought was very very interesting, ripe for exploration, where the turtle looks at the human being, so to speak, in some sense. And I think one of the interesting claims that Shazia makes at the beginning of her book is the distinction between fiction and nonfiction, and of course, fiction as something that can be right. I think this this was an this was an opportunity to think about what the world could have looked at, at from the turtle's point of view. I mean, of course, we can avoid anthropomorphism here in the sense that we do not have to, in some sense, impose human frames of looking in, in many ways. But I think animal studies and robust animal studies approaches in many ways have talked about alter ways of being and existing in the world, right? What is the turtle's way of existing? What is its umwelt, so to speak, if you were you're going to use Utskul's version? And I think this is an interesting moment which I felt could have been extended more. That was something that I mentioned in my review as well. But all in all, this is a wonderful work opens up a lot of interesting questions and I would be interested to hear what Claire says and then we can go on to the rest. Um, thank you for those really kind of, I think, um, this comprehensive take on the book. It makes us think about the books in like multiple ways and who knows, you know, the turtle might inspire uh, Shazia's second book, you know, we might have a book, <laughs> we have a book out on, you know, we have the Anthropocene, we have the non-Anthropocene. Um, I now invite Dr. Chambers to share her thoughts with us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. It's a real privilege. Uh, I think this is a hard act to follow both Amit and Shazia, but I'll do my best. Um, I want to thank Think First and Folio Books, and of course my fellow panelists and, and Saba for sharing. It really is a pleasure to discuss this beautiful and urgent book with you all. Because I think place and post-colonial eco-feminism has so many benefits and I think Amit has really outlined those very comprehensively but one thing I want to sort of highlight is the way that Shazia reads against the grain of a range of texts by Pakistani women artists. I mean these are texts that I do research as well as teach um, like Amit and um, the novels on the surface seem to have little to do with eco-feminism. Um, I was a bit surprised in a way by some of them. I mean some of them Maybe the films are a, a bit more clear, but what with the novels like Noor and um, Geometry of God and Burnt Shadows, it wasn't immediately apparent to me. 
But the close attention Shazia pays to industry's incursions into nature, food and water means that I'll never look in at Pakistani literature or film in quite the same way again. So I think that's, you know, something that she's really offering um, to the world, to Pakistan, as she outlined in her introduction. And it means that I can wholeheartedly recommend this book. I, I started, you know, referencing it like mad and urging students to read it because it's really opening up the way we think about um, Pakistani letters and culture. And as we've been hearing from both speakers so far, Shazia is, you know, repeats this phrase, the place is it that is Pakistan, and you've heard her already say it today, and Amit discussed it so interestingly. I mean, there's always been this, you know, long debates about where or when to start with this young nation of Pakistan. You know, Kamala Shamsi talks about it in Offence, the Muslim case. You know, do we think about the Muslims of India? You know, is that our, you know, is that our history? It doesn't matter where in the subcontinent they come from, but they're, you know, there's a sort of, it's a, religious right approach, perhaps? Or do we think about the territory of Pakistan, which is to some extent what Shazi is doing? But she really beautifully talked about bringing together time and space. And I think that's what the book does so illuminatingly. I think she has a really useful approach countering populist nationalism and the religious rights, exclusionary emphasis on Islam as the nation's defining feature. Meanwhile, foreign outsiders like me often maintain an othering preoccupation with Pakistan's terror links. By contrast, Shazia shows that the place that is Pakistan is a territory characterised by multiple partitions. It has been scarred by the traumas suffered by Sikh and Hindu, as well as Muslim women. Today, this beautiful place is threatened by the slow violence of desertification, progressively more damaging floods and devastating extractivism. And Shazia's book is carefully structured to include such regions as the Punjab and the Thar Desert, which overspill the nation's borders. Shazia is a very astute reader of well-chosen films by women directors. As you have heard, chapter one to it touches on the urgent issue of Pakistan's water crisis. And Sabia Samar's award-winning Pakistani film, Kamal Shapani, Zylan Waters, is largely set around the year 1979 amid the Zia ul regime. At the film's core is a flashback to Sikh women who took their lives by jumping into village wells to escape rape amid the chaos of partition. Although on first blush, this theme seems to have little to do with the environment, Shazia shows that violence against women and rapaciousness towards the natural world are closely intertwined. These women's coerced suicides in the name of honour went together with their male relatives' decision to poison the well water as they retreated across the border in 1947. So you have violence against women and against nature. The second film under scrutiny is Marin Jabbar's Ramchan Pakistani. And in chapter two, Shazia examines this film's portrayal of Tar Desert as a bioregion, so a unified place defined by nat natural borders. And as you've been hearing in the Tar Desert's case, this bioregion is an arid zone that overspills the Indo Pak dividing line, making a significant contrast. Uh, contribution to border theory, Shazia traces the lineaments of bonded labour, caste hierarchies and an inequitable access to food. These are snarled up fault lines that transcend national boundaries. The barrenness of the desert parallels the bleak lives of women, particularly those from religious and caste minorities. Shazia also takes what I think is a very important decision to include Bengal in her next chapter on Pakistani author Suraya Khan's novel Noor. By focusing on the West Pakistani rape of women and land amid the 1971 war, she works to broaden understandings of South Asian writing in English and specifically PWE or Pakistani writing in English. Highlight, highlighting how the gap between West and East Pakistan from 1971 onwards became a canyon, she stresses that women's bodies and the natural world were on the front line in both partitions of 47 and 71. 
and some suggestive parallels are excavated between the state's extraction-oriented approach to both Bengal and Baluchistan. And I mean, Amit had a, a very minor criticism. I guess my minor is not a, not really a criticism, but it was a shame there was no chapter on Baluchistan, um, you know, given all the troubles in this separatist province. But I also think this is completely understandable, given the dearth of women's writing or, or feature films um, that are easily available from this region. So that that again could be a project for the future, I hope, because it's it's a real silence in, in much of Pakistani literature and culture. Usma Aslam Khan's Thinners and Skin is all about glaciers, which are, of course, linked to water and want water, co water conservation. But because of Shazia's illuminatingly counterintuitive approach, the reading against the grain that I was talking about, she chooses Khan's previous novel, Trespassing, instead. This ostensibly urban fiction of Karachi contains the rich discussion about turtles that we've been talking about, but also shells and silkworms. In the final chapter, Shazia turns her attention to what she calls the animalization of the Nagasaki survivor Hiroko in Kamala Shamsi's Burnt Shadows. Just as bioregions are not confined within national borders, so too is the fallout from nuclear war uncontainable. Shazia explores how Shamsi links Hiroko's peregrinations with those of the migrated cranes burnt to her back as a permanent reminder of the atomic bomb blast. So from, to conclude, environmental concerns are sometimes presented as a global north preoccupation. Meanwhile, the global south is thought to have more pressing worries around despotic leaders, lack of human rights, hunger and disease. But with heart and political commitment, Shazia avers that no such easy demarcation is possible. As she said in her introduction, she really does connect the dots between different forms of oppression. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chambers, for that really um, incisive analysis of the book and especially the connectivity that you trace across the different chapters and what it means in, in, the, global, uh, in the local as well as the global context. Um, I, we can now invite the audience to type their questions for Dr. Rahman or any of the other panelists, and we'd be happy to answer them. But in the meanwhile, uh, maybe I think we could, um, Dr. Rahman, I had a question about um, the reception of of the book in the North American audience or the North American classroom. How how do you feel the reception has been since this book has been out for a while, right? With the University of Nebraska. This book has been out for a while in a pandemic. <laughs> so, An achievement. <laughs> you know, um, I, there have been uh, both both Amit and Claire have have reviewed uh, very very generously reviewed it and there has been some other uh reviews in various journals but um yeah um <laughs> i don't teach my book uh in fact i don't teach uh any of the things that i've written i i've written a number of articles as well as this book and and uh but what i do in the classroom is i I try to bring those ideas. I, I tell my students, you don't need to write, read what I've written because you have me. <laughs> I am here. And so I can, I can, uh, yeah, I, I can just uh, be here. They, student, I will say this, I will say that um, students really, really appreciate um, Surya Khan's novel, Noor. Um, I think part of it is the disability uh, issue that they really connect with, um, which, you know, I wish that I had talked more. I, there are many things I wish. I wish I had talked more about animals, Balochistan, and disability, <laughs> right? Um, but, you know, there's always more time. Um, but yeah, students really love uh, Noor because of the issues of disability. They also really love Noor because of uh, because so many of my students are, are veterans, military, US military veterans. And uh, it's very much a story about a, a veteran mm -hmm. um, and, and his issues um, that come up uh, 
So I see there are questions. Yes, uh, we have other questions. Would you like to um, answer them in the order or should I just read them out for you? What would you prefer? Uh, can you see the questions? I think I, I can, yes. Okay, then I think you should just, you know, answer the questions as you see appropriate. Well, um, the first question is, how can environmentalism and feminism connect at the practical level in Pakistan? Um, I honestly, I, I started writing this book a very long time ago. And when I started writing this book, I was thinking uh, about this question. And I was, I was thinking, you know, that this should happen, right? That, that, that's where the, the book ends. But by the time I was done writing it, it, it was happening on a practical level. So the first time the Aurat March happened in, in Pakistan, I immediately went online to see if I could find their manifesto. And their manifesto very clearly uh, said that, uh, you know, the rights that they're fighting for uh, are all of the rights that we would expect the Women's March to fight for, but it included environmental um, aspects to it, and uh, and so I was like, "Well, this is happening. This is great." Um, and so I, I think that that is uh, the, the to ask on the practical level is is uh, to look to the activists. Uh, I am an academic, and uh, my goal is to help people think in certain ways. Um, to help them then do something practical with how they're thinking. Um, but I am actually not an activist, although I show up at protests and marches as much as I can, <laughs> but I'm not organizing them. Um, and, so, and so that's how I would answer that question. I, I, I'm sure the panelists have well, plenty to say as well. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um. Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Claire, would you like to also talk about this? I'd like to briefly go back to uh, the reception of her book in the North American Academy. Um, I've, I've taught it uh, in my classes, her first chapter, for instance. But there's an issue in terms of the way in which the reception or the teaching of South Asian text, I think, work in American Academy. In general, uh, you know, when you talk about since if you think about the last 10 years or so, South Asian jobs have virtually disappeared. I, you know, in a way you can, uh, the, the, uh, the hiring usually happens for global anglophone, it happens for world lit, it happens for a kind of larger kind of post-colonial framework in some sense. And then the limitation with uh, positions like that, and I think I kind of rail against it a lot myself, is that, you know, when you say eco-criticism, right? You teach only the hungry type. That's the only text that people teach in some ways, right? So, like, and, and that's the only text which kind of gets crossed over in some sense it, in, into courses which are not post-colonial either. Or now, with animal studies, there's animals, people. You know, there are examples like that which I think kind of predominate in many ways. So, the issue is, I think, for those of us who teach texts like these, is to actually make them, in some sense relatable to the students, partially because one of the things which comes up, especially when you teach a lot of South Asian texts, is both people who read your work as well as students who often you teach in classes, like, oh, this seems too foreign, right? This seems too foreign. So you have to do a lot of, like, cultural decontextualization. This is something, of course, I refuse to do in my classes, that in some ways, if you want to do, let's say, a million of loss, I don't contextualize that for you. So similar, in a similar way, I'm not going to contextualize how much money it comes surreptitiously on the sites. We'll talk more about the local specificities, but I think it's a question of presentation as well. And I think this is something that needs to be done on a greater basis. And that's where books like Shazia's could help really. And I guess, I mean, just a quick point about the very good question about environmentalism and feminism connecting at the practical level. I mean, I think um, that Shazi has expressed a real admiration for millennials and especially Gen Z and sort of the passion and the, the politics, you know, the urgency of their politics um, that I think that these activists, you know, use the aesthetics of advertising in a way, you know, it's it's very visual sound bites, very clever using memes and humor, um, which they're doing really well. And the Aura March is, you know, a good example of that kind of 
playfulness but seriousness at the same time and I really liked what Shazi was saying about you know the difference between activism and academia and its productive overlap because obviously you know Shazi's book is long form it's the product of clearly a lot of years of deep thinking and writing and and reading um so it is a very different medium um but I think both are, are very necessary we need the kind of you know, very, like you say, practical activism is so important and maybe it has a wider reach and it's instantaneous. But Shazia's book is very much slow cooked and, you know, not not to be dismissed, you know, just because it it certainly will have a smaller audience, sadly, but I'm really glad it's on Pakistani shores and it's such an important book. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Dr. Aman, we have a couple of questions. I'll read them out. Um, I think I'll bundle them together. Um, there's one question that talks about, um, you know, your idea of post-colonial ecofeminism and how it reimagines power relations, but how does that uh, reimagination kind of work across uh, women who belong to dominant groups and women who belong to marginalized groups? So I think a question of class is coming up in relation to post-colonial ecofeminism. And then a second one is how do local cultural identities fit into your approach? I think your your mic is. On. I'm sorry, I was I was muted. Um, uh, so uh, the and there are there are lots of questions, and so uh, I'm wondering if you could. Uh, I, I see the second one you asked, how does local cultural identities fit into your approach? Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that my approach is is very local and uh, cultural. I, I think that when you focus on place, it, it has to be local. It, that is, uh, everything begins with the local. Um, the reason I mention uh, global issues is because they affect the local. Um, they always do. And so, uh, yeah, I think that, that that question I was able to find, but the first question that you uh, mentioned, I'm not sure which one it I can, is. Because I can dense it because I, I think it's um, slightly oh, on the longer dense. side. I, th I, I think they're talking about class, right? So they're raising an issue of class. Like how does class kind of prefigure into the ways that you're looking at post-colonial ecofeminism, especially, you know, in terms of women belonging to the dominant group? versus women coming from the margins? Oh, yeah. No, I, I completely understand that question because obviously, you know, these, these, these five women that I'm talking about in my book, uh, you have to come from a certain class to write a novel in English. You have to come from a certain class to, uh, you know, have a cre create a, a film, a feature film. Uh, absolutely. And um, I think that one of the reasons why I brought in the films to discuss in my book was because uh, you know the novels I discuss are very much about women from a, a, a more dominant class, like a, a more elite class. Uh, these women are writing about women like themselves, uh, and so and so. If my book didn't include the the films, then my book would only be about about those women. Um, and so I included some films because the films uh, are about ordinary women. And uh, I'm not an anthropologist. You know, if I was an anthropologist, then I would interview ordinary women and all my research would be on ordinary women. <laughs> uh, but I'm not an anthropologist. I'm a literary critic. I'm a literary critic who works in English. And this just means certain things for the kind of criticism that I end up doing. Um, but that doesn't mean that I uh, am more interested in uh, the rich, right? Uh, I, I, I understand that uh, capitalism is a, is a force that we cannot get outside, that it affects us all in different ways. And um, I'm, just, I'm just not a, a, one, a single issue person. And so, um, and so I insist that we also talk about patriarchy. I insist that we also talk about the environment. Uh, I think the other panelists have something to say about this topic. <laughs> There was a question for which addressed both Shazi and me. So I'll just try to briefly address this question about non-human agency in South Asian literature in relation to gender. Um, 
of course, I could give you examples from a lot of texts that haven't been translated from Bengali and Assamese, which are there. But I'll, the example that I'll probably give later on is from the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, uh, Roy, which I've, I'm currently writing about in my book as well. But before we go to that, uh, the question of you know non-human agency in relation to gender, I think a lot of interesting work has ha has already happened in multi-species ethnography, which deals with Radhika Govindarajan's book Animal Intimacies, for instance. The second chapter talks about not only relationships of care, but relationships of violence that comes in terms of our relationship with animals as well. I mean, the question of non-human agency definitely comes up there, but the question of relationality, the fact that it can be both caring and violent. I mean, she focuses on a group, for instance, of women in the, uh, living in the central Himalayas who have, uh, who, who develop relationships, for instance, with the goats, which will eventually be sacrificed, right? So I think it's an interesting chapter that to a very thick description brings up questions of violence, relationality, and care, so to speak. And I think this is something that you notice in a lot of literary texts. In Assamese, there was a brilliant poem by this uh, this Assamese writer, Boro Origin. Uh, it's called it's called Snails, where basically she talks about her childhood experience of eating the snail, right, from the shell. And then the second one, there's a kind of relationship between the vulnerability of the snail without its shell with the human body, right? So it's kind of like this reversal which happens there. So this everyday mundane act of actually eating the snail out from the shell, sucking it out, taking it out. I mean, think about the fleshy inside and the hard outside, the snail being such an interesting, you know, animal figure in terms of its symbolism and its materiality itself. And then it comes back into that framework. And for me, I think, uh, if you think of Anglophone texts, there are quite a few, but I'll focus on, on Ministry of Utmost Happiness because one of the things which has interested me, and this also goes, uh, touches upon the issue of extinction in many ways, is that the opening coda is about the disappearance of vultures and sparrows, right? So vultures, of course, have a have a big role to play in, 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 in the book overall. If, uh, and then, of course, the, the sparrow reference is a blink and miss reference, if you think about it. But if you look at the hardcover copy of it, the, the design which was done by my Austin Sufi, at the end, you have a vulture and a sparrow as well, right? So there's a way in which, in some sense, extinction is what pervades the novel throughout, so to speak, in some ways, right? So there's a way in which it begins with extinction, an actual animal extinction, but then it talks about disappearing people, right? People who are like perching uh, at the edges of the city like sparrows that have lost their footing for that matter. Or if you think, for instance, about, um, you know, the framework of, of uh, you know, um, uh, people who are left behind in this whole framework of history and so on. That, that there's, a, there's a beautiful phrase that she uses. So I think in a lot of these texts, these keep on coming back and forth, extinction, relationships with animals of varied, varied characters in some ways. And I think this is important for us as literary critics to understand. But I'll stop there. So. And I just wanted to pick up on what Shazi said before, which was, I'm not a single issue person. Um, you know, I think I'm really in awe of the way you do this, Shazia. You know, your really intersectional approach, because it's not easy to hold together, as you do, so many different issues, the environment, gender, class, um, time, space. Um, you, you're juggling so many things, but not at the danger of shallowness. Um, and I just, I, I'm in admiration of that because I'm not a single issue person either, but I do tend to separate things out for different pieces just for the sake of writerly neatness, because it's really complex what you're doing. I think it must have been such hard labor. And it just made me think not only of Kimberly Crenshaw, intersectionality, but, you know, the dangers of a single story that Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie talks about, and also Audre Lord, who says that each of us has a story to tell. And that's what I think your book is so rich. You might only have five texts, but it's emblematic of so much more. Um, and somebody else who does this in a South Asian context, who work, your work reminds me a bit of each other. There's um, a Pakistani academic now at Durham University, Mariam Mirza, and her book, Intimate Class Acts, is about women and their servants, and it's about class, race, gender. Um, so I'm, you know, I've got to take my hats off to, to women, women academics doing this very difficult but very important work across boundaries as well, because both of you talk about India and Pakistan in really illuminating ways. Thank you. Um, I think we have time left for one question. 
I think we can maybe have the last question, which talks about one of the major issues with development in Pakistan has been the extinction of rare animal species that used to roam about freely while we were growing up. How do you think post-colonial ecofeminism can address these very real issues outside the fictional domain? <laughs> well, <laughs> that is an excellent question. <laughs> um, as I've said, I like to try to help people think, right? And so if I, if something that I write helps people think of uh, both the ways in which humans and non-human beings um, are unable to move around freely uh, because of these borders that we have and these issues that we have and um, if, I, if I've been able to help people bring those two things together in their mind, then to me, that's the first step. And then the second step is figuring out, okay, now what are we going to do about this? But, but the important thing is that we have to imagine something, we have to think something before we can do anything, right? So I, so, so I do feel that... Um, my job is to help my students and my readers imagine something and think about something so that they can then figure out what to do. Um, because I am, yeah, I, I don't have all the answers. I, I don't, you know, if, if it was, yeah. Um, but there are people who write policy, right? They, they write policies and, and those policies then become uh, the policies of organizations and the policies of governments and the right and so and so I I just hope that um, that I can help people think in different ways that might then lead to policies that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, I think sadly we're running towards, I think, the end of the session, much as I would love to, I think, have this conversation continue. So uh, rather than have an abrupt end, um, I would like to conclude uh, this session by thanking the organizers, Folio Books and Think Fest. I would like to thank the audience for joining us and, and a huge thank you to our wonderful panelists, really, for such a thought-provoking and illuminating conversation. I've learned so much in the process, and I hope others have too. And I would encourage everyone to please buy and read Dr. Rahman's book. It's <laughs> It's truly important. It's truly timely. Um, we should all learn from it. Um, thank you, everyone, once again. This has been a pleasure, and I hope everyone has a good evening. Um, take care. Goodbye. <laughs>